anything else like that, please just let me know. Um, oh. And we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. All right. So um, once again, hello, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here. Um, my name is James, and I'm the Digital Media Project Manager at the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access. Um, so we are known as SCILDA for short. Uh, we are a pan-institutional office. We work with the 19 museums, nine research centers, National Zoo, and all the other parts of the Smithsonian. And uh, our primary uh, mission here is to connect the Smithsonian's content to educators and students. We primarily do this through the K-12 settings, but we also explore informal learning as well. Um, we're an entirely digital office, so a lot of times we're asking ourselves, what is the role of digital media in a museum? My broader question is kind of an ongoing focus for my office, uh, but for myself specifically, I, I look at digital media through the lens of game-based learning and uh, interactive media. So this little Venn diagram here that I put together, um, interactive media comes in a lot of different flavors and for a lot of different purposes. Typically what I'm asked to do is focus on games and game-based learning, but it's important to keep in mind that by and large games are actually just a subset of a broader category called play. So several of the examples that I'm going to showcase today, oh, can, can you all see the slide? Okay. Like mo Looks like most of you can see the slides. Okay. I'm sorry, Tony. Um, I will publish them later if you, if you can't figure out how to see them. Um, uh, so anyways, yeah, it's important to keep in mind that by and large games are, are a subset of a broader category called play. Um, so a lot of the examples that I'm going to show you today actually fall closer to the border between games and play um, rather than being deep in that teal sphere. So that's because forms of digital play often push the boundaries of what we traditionally conceive of as games, which is very good. That's exactly what we need. So in many ways, games both educational and entertainment focused, I would argue, have been stagnant. Um, that being said, we've seen a, a good deal of innovation in the last five to ten years with the rise of the indie market. So we're starting to rediscover that games can and should be doing more than just cloning each other. Today I'm going to talk about trends that we're seeing in music ga museum games specifically, along with some good examples of games that are bucking those trends a little bit. So I'm also going to talk about the qualities that we need to see in a museum game development programs in the future so that that can help push us further. Um, so I like to say, oh, and to Karen, there is a tiny intersection of work um, between play and work. I, I count myself in that intersection, but I know a lot of other folks who don't. So that's, that's why I put that on the outside. Also, dragons can be very serious, so I'd like to include at least some dragons outside of the play uh, sphere. So um, I like to say, what I like to say is, if people aren't thinking about a cool museum game at home right now, then we're not doing enough. We need to try harder. And we need to reach more people, and we need to keep making better and better games. So these are the four questions that I'm going to address today. Who, where, how, and why. Um, who, as in who are we targeting? That should always really be our first question when we're designing a museum game. The next question is, where are they going to be playing this? Because often that's not as obvious as you might think. It's an important question. It kind of defines the parameters of the experience. Third, how are you going to get them to play this? What is the motivation? It's not enough for us to say that they're going to play this because we will force them to. So that's, that's worked in the past where we've told teachers, this is what's best for your students. Now go and make them do it. But that doesn't work as well with games, and it, it really shouldn't. We shouldn't be doing that. Um, we don't have to make games like that. Um, and finally, why? Why are they playing this game? If you're going to take over a little piece of somebody's life for an hour, and if you're going to take them and, and show them a window into the new world, you need to have a good reason to do that. There has to be some sort of payoff at the end, uh, something that's going to affect them on a fundamental level. Sorry, I didn't advance the slide there. So um, moving on to the first question, we have who. So let's start with audience. Many game programs start in the education offices at museums. These education offices are already looking towards younger audiences, so it's no surprise that most museum games tend to focus on youth. There's also a persistent belief that gamers are young. And while that may have been true in the past, 39% um, of gamers are now 36 or older. So we can't assume that every gamer is a young, white male playing Halo. It's just not the situation anymore. Another recent addition to the most uh, common target audiences is millennials. So the thinking there is that millennials grew up with Mario, 
and therefore they have a greater interest in games. It's a huge market segment, so often you'll see those uh, sort of initiatives stemming from outreach and marketing offices targeting these folks more so than the education offices. So different games for different purposes. So uh, coming over here, here's the first example that I wanted to show folks. This is the Strawberry Thief, uh, which many of you have probably seen from the Victoria and Albert Museum. So in this game, you're a bird that feeds off of strawberries. Um, as you fly about the world eating strawberries, you also uncover parts of a famous William and Morris textile piece. At first, you're only filling in line work. Then you kind of make a first attempt at color. And finally, you end up revealing vivid and animated colors and objects that more or less bring the tapestry to life. So getting back to audience, the game is certainly kid-friendly, right? There's no violence. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, there's not a lot of uh, penalties for wrong answers, things like that. Um, but there's something else at play here, too. The game is also going for the enthusiasts and artist markets. Someone who's over 45 doesn't feel ridiculous playing this game. It doesn't treat you like a child or talk down to you. Um, in fact, it's even scored through a collaboration with the Royal Scottish Na National Orchestra. And in all honesty, it's a, it's a beautiful game. So in many ways, this game is actually intergenerational. And that's a really powerful thing for a game to be because games can be um, a very strong way to bring families together. So moving on to learning environment. Um, again, if we understand that most museum game projects start in the education or outreach offices of a museum, then we can't be surprised that most of them are targeting experiences that take place in the gallery itself or by proxy in schools. The problem here is that even though museums themselves are considered an informal learning environment, both of these environments are more formal than at-home environments. So while these are perfectly appropriate target learning environments, we're also missing a huge player base. Now this is based on the assumption that children, which again, here is the presumed target audience, must be forced to play an education game. But that's only partially true. So a recent study by NYU had children view a still image from a game. To one group of children, they told them that this image was from an action game. To the other group of children, they told them that this that this image from this game was an educational game. They then asked both groups if they would like to play the game. So in the action group, the kids who had been told that this is an action game, 80% of the children said that they would want to play that game. In the education group, so the group that was told that this was an educational game, only 20% of the children said that they would want to play the game. So it's a 60% difference between action and education um, with essentially the same form of media. So what does that tell, tell us? Well, if we back up a little bit, we can remember back to the edutainment boom and bust, right? When they used to be big business back in the days with companies like Broderbund, and kids were excited to play educational games like Carmen San Diego, um, and they would be so excited they'd actually play these in their free time. So then during the boom, we saw the market kind of inundated with all of these bad education games. Um, they were didactic. They were unfun. They were boring education games, and it more or less poisoned the well. Um, oh, and the citation, yeah, if you can go to uh, create.nyu, I'll have it up here a little bit, but it's create.nyu.edu, and they have a ton of great research on there. Um, so many children today, they don't remember these games, but there's still this stigma attached to educational games, right? When we describe games as educational, we know that we have an extra burden on us to convince players that the game is going to be fun. Um, it can be done, though. Good educational games find a way to bridge that gap. And one of the best examples, I think, would probably be something like Filament's Reach for the Sun, which does a, a great uh, job on Steam, um, taps into a commercial market. Um, but there are other options here that I'd like to talk about. We can carve a different path. So a lot of people find this stat surprising, this other one that I have up here. Half of all U.S. households own a dedicated video game console, and most of that group owns two. So instead of forcing people to come to our games, why not meet them where they already at are? So, the second example, and one of my new favorite projects is, uh, that's trying to tap into this market, is Tate Worlds. So in uh, Tate Worlds, the Tate and Tate kids recognize that their target market is on Minecraft, and that Minecraft is a great platform for exploring. So why not give children and adults the opportunity to explore artworks while they're already there? Um, so they released four Minecraft max, maps, and uh, each of them was an explorable 3D recreation of a particular piece of artwork from the Tate's collection. So Table Worlds only recently launched. I know that there will be I, I know that I myself will be very interested in seeing the evaluation data from that program once it's had some time to run its course. Um, we can find an, out answers to what are the behaviors of youth that participate in this world? Does this spark interest in existing artworks? Does this spark interest in creating new artwork? 
And I think the effects of this type of experience are kind of an open question to all of us right now, um, which is also why it's so exciting that the state is doing something like this instead of kind of making yet another more traditional museum game. So moving on to the how at this point, um, the third question here centers on player motivation. Why are players playing this game and how will they stay engaged? If we're focused on youth in education settings, again, our, our knee-jerk reaction is often to say that these children and students are going to play these games because we tell them to. Um, but this motivation strategy is not the most conducive one to learning. Uh, students learn better when they find intrinsic reasons to be motivated. So and here's that link to the NYU uh, site, which has a ton of great research on motivation and on other factors. Um, Another thing that I also frequently hear is that children will play because children like games. But that puts the cart before the horse, right? It's a logical fallacy. Children and most adults like things that are fun. Therefore, they like games that are fun. By extension, they may not like games that are not fun. So we can't just assume that because it's a game, children are going to flock to it. Um, when we're designing some of these games, often we get caught up in trying to make it feel like a game. We take the trappings of other successful games and we copy them without really asking why. So that's why we end up with so many of these educational games that have this concept of points without any real driving reason for the player to acquire those points. We get high score leaderboards without those leaderboards adding any value. We get gamified learning like um, Duolingo, for example, which gives us levels without having any of those levels actually affect gameplay. So the next example here. Um, full disclosure, I have not played this game because it's an in-person experience that is only available in London. Uh, very jealous I can't go visit. Uh, that being said, this is a photo from Against Captain's Orders, which is a live-action, role-playing inspired game-like experience that's run out of the National Maritime Museum in London in conjunction with Punch Drunk. Um, so in this game, children are swept away in an immersive live-action adventure. After initially being introduced to several of the museum's important historical objects, they find that what do you know if these objects have just been stolen? They run through the underbelly of the museum, they solve puzzles, they rummage around, find hidden objects, and interact with the actors. But all are taking part of the show, and all of that on a time limit as they try to solve this mystery. So the reason why I wanted to talk about against Captain's Orders is because it doesn't have points, levels, or even much competition. It's just fun. It leans on an engaging story and a unique, exciting experience to draw all children into the adventure. My, personally, I believe that museums are often at their best when they can transport their visitors to another time, another place, another perspective. And if we're looking to do this, there's no better medium than games. So, and that's really important, so I'm going to say it again. If we're looking to help visitors explore a new world, there's no better medium to do that than, than through video games. So why do we so often make games where we ask visitors to memorize facts instead of enveloping them in the many stories that live within our collections? So the fourth question here, why? Um, why are we making these games? What are we trying to achieve? For PR offices, we might be looking at increasing attendance, um, you know, increasing the number of people who come through our museums. For education offices, we're more often looking at learning outcomes. So how do we approach learning outcomes? Oh, can you all hear me? Hello? OK. OK. That's a lot of yeses. All right, I'll keep going. Um, and hopefully Hannah, Hannah can keep coming with us. Um, uh, so how do we, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll try and talk louder. Um, so how do we approach learning outcomes? If we're targeting classrooms specifically, often we need to go the route of putting the game into the hands of, of the teacher. So that means going through administrators or to teachers individually. What research has shown is that right now, teachers want experiences that are aligned to common core standards. So these experiences can fill gaps in their curriculum and help them meet their standards requirements. But is that what we really want to do? It comes down to the goals of your program. Are you targeting classroom experiences and trying to reach students through the teacher? Or are you trying to reach students directly and find ways to inspire them? Do you care if those students learn common core aligned material? Or do you care more that they're inspired to create art, become scientists, historians? Now, those aren't mutually exclusive situations, but you need to have primary focus. So when you're developing a museum game, you need to start with the who, the audience, right? But if you don't have this why part locked down, then you just end up spinning your wheels. So this next, uh, so here's one from, the, from us, from the Smithsonian. This is a screenshot from Ripped Apart, which is a new mobile game from our American History Museum. It's out right now, so you can go out and grab it. 
Um, the game is aligned to relevant standards for high school um, history curriculum. The experience is designed to be played through in under an hour so that it can fit in a classroom period. And by all accounts, this is a classroom teacher-ready game. But what I love about this game is that it doesn't do this through a quiz interface or something that's really heavy-handed. Instead, it models skills used by historians and researchers. So you can see here in this mini game that you're looking at a historical text to try and discern the meaning of a word um, by, or by trying to decipher this smudged out word. We see that the types of questions on um, standardized tests everywhere, right? We see that question on ACT, SAT, uh, to determine the word based on the context of the text. But instead of trying to tackle that head-on from a quiz type uh, method, Ripped Apart puts the experience in context and makes the skill feel relevant. So why are we learning how to read words in context? We're doing it so that we can better understand our world because this is a skill that is used by professionals to understand historical and ancient worlds. That's a compelling reason to kids. Right, yeah, Tony, I see your point. Yeah, definitely. We typically focus on Common Core. Um, we also do a lot of uh, NGSS stuff as well. So, um, yeah, but definitely. Um, and we are looking at other standards as well. So I've covered some of the common answers to questions that we're asking. Um, I would like to start out the second part by saying that museum games are an underdeveloped medium. Um, think, if you really think about it, Pong came out in 1972. Uh, Super Mario Brothers came out in 1985. So that was 30 years ago. By contrast, so if we compare this to film, which is another form of media, right? Um, should be comparable here. Film was invented in essentially the 1890s, and it took nearly 30 years before we started seeing some of the best examples of silent cinema. It took us 50 years to get from there to Citizen Kane. It took us 80 years to get from there to The Godfather, and 100 years to get from there to the first Jurassic Park. So with that perspective, where are we in the timeline of video games? Where are we in the timeline of museum games? There's a lot more thinking to be done and a lot more exploration. Now, I don't mean I don't I don't mention Jurassic Park here idly, right? Jurassic Park marked a, for any of you who are like film people like myself. Um, Jurassic Park marked a sea change in cinema when we started to see the first serious attempts at incorporating CGI into films. It's hard to imagine a high budget budget film now without computer graphics, but that didn't even start until a century after film was invented. So if we're going to move forward, if we're going to push this field of museum games forward, and more broadly speaking, video games in general then what do we need to be doing? So the four things that I, I think that we really need to be working on are more exper experimentation, more collaborations, more data, and more story. So sorry, just trying to keep up with some of these chats. So um, this next one is a screenshot from a virtual reality experience created during an Oculus VR jam competition. In this prototype, you can enter Van Gogh's Night Cafe painting. The world, which you can move around in, explore, um, is rendered in Van Gogh's style, and you can actually engage with Van Gogh himself while you're in it. I have this under the title of More Experimentation. This was created by one man over a three-week period, um, and it's easily one of the more interesting things that I've seen done with artwork and virtual reality. It didn't come from a museum. It came from a person who was participating in a, in a competition. So as, as museum professionals, I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit sad to say that when we're thinking about art and virtual reality, often our first instinct is to create a virtual museum and hang virtual paintings on virtual walls. But why? Why are we recreating the physical when we can create something digitally that could never be done in the physical world? Um, that's, that's what video games offer us, the opportunity to try new things. So we have a nascent medium here and some of the best content in the world. Let's experiment. Let's try new things. So this next one, this is Valiant Hearts. It's a game that was released by Ubisoft in 2014 um, about the stories of four sol soldiers or uh, participants in World War I. The story is based on historical letters from the war, and it includes many historical references and facts. It was released on the PlayStation 3, the PlayStation 4, Xbox 360, Xbox One, on Steam. Um, it has a pretty high Metacritic score of about 80% for all of those consoles, and it's received several awards. In the credits, it gives thanks to the Library of Congress and the Australian War Memorial, among others, and makes note um, that much of its historical content was derived from collaborations with Clark Costell and Company, a historical film production company, um, and a few others. 
So Valiant Hearts dove much deeper into history than most other games out there on the market, but still feel like this was a missed opportunity. A stronger partnership with the cultural institution could have had this game driving players to other places, museums, libraries, historical societies, to learn more after the experience. And vice versa, we could have seen museum visitors and educators using our resources then being introduced to this game at the same time. It's a win-win kind of symbiotic relationship that could have occurred here. So if we want to push museum games forward, if we want to meet people where they already are instead of preaching to the choir, I think a lot of I think what we really need to explore are even deeper partnerships between video game development studios who have a lot of expertise and cultural institutions who have a lot of content. So this slide, you know, I, I, was, I don't really even need to explain. Um, we need more data. Um, and I'm not just saying that as a, as a person with a computer science background. Um, it's, it's fairly self-evident, right? Entertainment game companies are collecting huge amounts of user, user data. Previously, this was very hard to do. Now it's much easier. So this is just one of, one of many examples out there. This is a screenshot of Playnomics, which is a module you can use in Unity to collect player analytics. Um, we have an opportunity here to collect the kinds of data that will help us make more informed decisions about future game products. Um, we should continue to explore that opportunity, leverage that information to find new ways to engage with visitors. More importantly, we need to share this data. So museums make games far too infrequently to go on this alone, right? We're not pumping out three games every year. Um, we're not even pumping, some of us aren't even pumping out one big game every year. Um, we're, if we're going to start seeing these trends, we need to share this amongst each other. Um, we need to continue to use conferences and other venues to share lessons learned and the raw data as well so that we can move together and move forward as an industry. So uh, the last recommendation, and I'm not going to go into this too much either, um, is that museum games should contain more story. So this is a huge topic. It's one that I'm very passionate about, as many of you already know. Um, I believe that narrative is the way to people's hearts. I think it builds empathy. I think it empowers formal learning. Um, and I think it inspires players to greatness. Um, so again, I don't have a ton of time to go into this too deeply today, but um, I am planning a, a full uh, one-hour session at the Serious Play Conference in Pittsburgh in July, um, where I'll be hashing this out with some other examples. Um, and uh, if you go to the Serious Play site, you can check out the specific details about the conference there. So the last thing that I'll say here is to please keep talking about this. Um, I'm always on Twitter. Uh, that's often the best place to find me. You can use hashtag MuseGames to talk about this presentation and other museum game topics so that we can keep track of the conversation. I um, hope to see you all on there. And I just blew through that really fast, actually. So um, there's plenty of time for questions if any of you have that. I see Jessica's on there about driving on and offline learning. If you haven't seen the, uh, the, the NSF report on WolfQuest, which is one of Dave Schaller's games, that's fantastic. Um, and that's really what got me thinking about a lot of these, um, these sorts of things. Because in WolfQuest, uh, which is kind of an MMORPG uh, for wolves. So you're a wolf, you're doing wolfy things, um, and you're doing it with other people who are pretending to be wolves. Um, but the cool thing about that game is that you saw people who played that game, and then they went on and did something else. They made these little hops, right, from the game to uh, volunteering at their at their nature preserve, or even something as little as reading fiction about wolves or um, uh, googling wolves, and that's the kind of things. I think that's where we really get into some powerful stuff with games, right? Because games alone are not going to replace a the teacher. They're never going to do that, but they can inspire interest, and that interest can lead to other venues, which are pr tried and proven ways of of getting people to. Um, to enter some of these STEM fields. Uh, that was WolfQuest, uh, Jane. So, yep, there it is. Looks like Ashley already pulled it up. Um, so other questions. Oh, uh, I see here. Uh, there's one from Karen. Can you elaborate on Jessica's note and the barriers between practitioners of game making versus more analog forms and informal education? So um, as far as analog forms go, I have to be, full disclosure, I love tabletop games. I think tabletop games are fantastic. Um, if you haven't seen some of the great work being done out there in the tabletop community or in the print and play community right now, I highly suggest it. Um, 1960, Making of the President is a fantastic way to learn about the election system. Uh, similar title, um, 
uh, Twilight Struggle. I've learned more about the Cold War than through that than I have through other situations. Um, I, I won't name any teachers by name, but um, uh, so I think analog games are right up there. I think they're a fantastic way to prototype digital games. I think they're a uh, really interesting way to merge with, with digital games. Um, so we're definitely all about that. Um, the, uh, there are the barriers between practitioners and, uh, and uh, kind of where we're at, um, if I'm understanding this a little bit. Um, there is kind of a big, big gulf between us in our little offices and, you know, Ubisoft as an example, or Nintendo or Sony or, or any of these other folks. Um, and you, you see it when you go out to conferences like Serious Play or Games for Change or some of these other ones, and you meet some of these people. Um, we just don't have the staff, the resources, the history to create the kinds of games that they do, right? We, we don't have the budget, um, to be quite honest, to do those sorts of things. Even some of those... Um, those smaller, more targeted efforts, like Never Alone, um, end up costing uh, far more than, uh, than than our office's yearly budget, to be honest. Um, that being said, um, there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from them. That's why it's so important to go to these conferences and share information. I think there's lessons to be learned on both sides. Um, and I also think that that's why we're so ripe for collaboration between these these, these two groups. Have you done, okay, so Jessica asks, have you done any partnerships where students play a game in the classroom, then come to the museum, or vice versa? So, you know, this is really challenging for me. Um, first first of all, I'll say I haven't done that. Our, our office primarily focuses on digital, um, and we often look to the folks who are never going to make it to the Smithsonian, right? So um, if you're a student in Utah or Idaho, um, you might not ever get to take, make the take the chance to, to take that flight or make that road trip all the way out to us in D.C. You might see some of our traveling exhibits where we have talked about maybe doing some uh, collaborative experiences that, that merge digital with traveling experiences. But um, but I'm really interested in these folks who are not going to have the, the means, the, the money, really, to get all the way out here to see these national treasures. Um, so So what does that mean for them? Um, I think one of the other concerns often is that uh, when they're in the museum, kind of learning is going to happen, right? There are so many great things to do in the museum that you really have to question, you know, if we're going to dedicate this person, we're going to take them and have them play a game for half an hour, have them play a game for an hour while they're in the museum. But the time that they're doing that, instead of seeing other exhibits or experiencing other activities at the museum, and so you really have to weigh the value there, too. Um, so I think that there are ways to drive interest so that people then visit the museums later. I think that there are some interesting things that can connect up between those two experiences. But by and large, I don't, I don't personally want to shy away from the entirely digital, yet still museum-driven experience. Um, so, and this is a little bit of an aside, but we, the, the Smithsonian has about um, less than 1% of its collection on display at any given time. Um, so we have a huge collection, right? 16% of our collection has been digitized at this point. So we have about 15% of our collection, you know, 15 times what we have on display that is digital. And what we need are people creating content around that. We need folks who are finding ways to make that accessible because we don't have the space to show it all. And people don't have the time to see it all when they're here, too. So there's just some interesting challenges for us. Um, Randall, have any museums done any escape rooms? It's a really prescient question. Um, not that I am aware of, um, although punch drunk stuff has been really interesting. Um, and, and they've been doing some things in, with theater outside of museums as well. Um, and they're located in the UK. Um, I don't think that that would be a crazy thing for a museum to do an escape room. Um, I think that's actually something that would be uh, that's, that's very interesting. Um, at the Games for Change conference, there were a bunch of folks um, they, they were kind of lumped together into the Nordic LARP group, so LARP being live action role playing. And uh, they released a book that you can find online for free um, called Nordic LARP. And they talk about all the different ways that they're bringing role playing to different parts of the world um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a change experience. And so um, I would highly recommend looking into that if that's a, at all of interest to you. They talk about bringing um, 
live action role playing games to Palestinian refugee camps, for example. Um, so really uh, lo-fi ways of enacting change because uh, I think they did the game on five euros or something. So, so let me also say this. There is no excuse for you not having a budget and still not making a game. You, it can be done. It just takes more creativity. Uh, Sandy, uh, is Muse Games short for Museum Games? Yeah, we have this weird thing on Twitter for us museum professionals where we shorten everything to Muse. I know there's also that studio called Muse Games, so it's really unfortunate for them. Um, but um, uh, yeah, there's hashtag Muse Games, hashtag Muse Social, hashtag, hashtag Muse Tech. Um, so pretty much anything you throw Muse in front of is, is games. So yeah, un unfortunately, we do share that with Muse Games. Well, maybe it's not unfortunate. We probably drive interest to both of the other folks. Um, okay, Karen says, can you share more about motivation for in-person gallery experiences that include gamification, i.e. points and rewards? So you want to be really careful here um, because when you're talking about points and rewards and gamification, you're talking about extrinsic reward motivators, right? And uh, psychological studies have consistently shown that if you're basing your experience on extrinsic rewards, you're actually demotivating the behavior that you want to do. So if any of you remember the... Um, the uh, the Book It program uh, from from back in the day that was essentially uh, that was run by Pizza Hut um, and that was essentially gamified reading right so mm -hmm. if you were going to do you would have kids come in and they would read books and then you would just sticker for it and eventually you would end up with coupons that would get you free pizzas at Pizza Hut well I mean according to most of the studies. There wasn't a formal study done on this, but according to the the way that these psychological studies roll out, it sounds like that's actually motivating eating pizza as opposed to reading. Um, and and it's kind of this weird thing in human psychology that if you if you reward somebody, some sometime they if you reward somebody every time they do something and then you stop giving those rewards, they they stop doing that activity. So um, so again, you have to be really careful. That's not to say that they can't enhance the experience. Um, and that they can't uh, be used appropriately, but they need to be. There needs to be a lot of thought given into it at the same time. And what the core experience needs to be needs to be intrinsic motivation. So you need to find some way that this person feels valuable and and sees value in enacting these these uh, these experiences. So I don't know if that answers your question, but maybe a little bit. Um, so here's one from another one from Jessica. Uh, Public-private partnerships or programming seems like a great avenue. Can you speak to this from your experience, or what you see as a good strategy for this to develop creative learning content experiences, tapping into museum content? Um, yes, I absolutely can. Um, first and foremost, uh, so I don't. I'm sorry, I don't remember where everyone is from, but go out into your own backyard and find the the local university, because by and large, a lot of those universities have students who are just chopping at the bit to do something that has meaning. Um, so we have kind of like this large untapped talent pool, and then we have museums who have a large untapped content pool. So there's all kinds of experimentation that can be done right there, which I, I think honestly isn't happening enough. Um, and that's some, some low-hanging fruit uh, for some really interesting conversations. Um, and don't dismiss community colleges either. There's some, some really interesting work being done there. Um, and some really interesting work that can be done um, leveraging the folks there. Now, as far as the as as far as the larger folks go, um, it, it can be a real challenge. So, if you're talking about you know wrangling the the uh, the big three like the the Sony, Nintendo, Microsoft sort of thing, um, because then you're playing according to what their corporate needs are, you know, which shouldn't be minimized. I mean, they they have to run this company, right? And trying to merge that with your more social mu mission. Um, and a lot of times that that can be more challenging. That's not to say that there can't be a lot of win-win situations. Um, I'm I'm an optimist when it comes to that. I think that there are a lot of things that we can be doing that would help both private and public. Um, so, but again, what we need are more experimentation, more collaborations, so that we can go to somebody eventually and say, "Hey, look at this partnership between this museum and this other corporation." It was so successful. Let's do it again. And uh, and we're not going to get there unless we start unless we start talking to people. Um, the other questions. 
Uh, what about if the rewards are more activity, e.g. if the reading reward is books? Karen, I'm not sure I understand that one. So if you have any additional information. Um, I will say that we have talked about this a lot in terms of badging, which I don't know if anyone is, is interested in here. Um, but we uh, we found, again, the, kind of the same thing where uh, if if you just drop students in and start awarding them digital badges for activities that they were doing um, without any context, then you're really turning badges into an ex extrinsic motivator, right? You're looking at these badges as uh, some kind of digital reward system for specific activities. But if you place those badges within a community and those badges stop being what the experience was and start being what you mean, what you val what, how you are valued in the community, you see a lot of interesting things happen. So, um, uh, so we, have a, we have a group here called Art Lab, which you can check out online. I think it's artlabplus.si.edu. Uh, um, but they have, uh, it's a drop-in hangout team space where kids come in to learn about digital competencies and uh, they learn Photoshop, game making, uh, sound editing, all that sort of stuff. And they have qualifications like accreditation sort of things there, which essentially are um, informal learning badges, right, because it's an informal learning space. Um, and uh, what, they, what they've found is that uh, the kids who come in the first time, the second time, the third time, they, they don't care about those things on the wall that have people's names, it doesn't really matter to them because they have no context for it. But once that kid is part of the community, they start seeing that that is a marker of how involved you are in the community, and that has intrinsic value to them. That's, that's, a, that's a, a feeling of a society, a feeling of community. Um, so um, so that's, a, that's been shown to be a real motivator for folks. Um, let's see. And I think that's most of them. Um, Tristan mentions instead of rewarding reading with pizza, reward it with books. That would be interesting. I don't know whether it would be intrinsic or extrinsic. Um, I would definitely do that though if there was somebody who told me I could read books to earn more books. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, but if there's any other questions, uh, feel free to post it here. If not, um, again, you can always use hashtag MuseGames uh, to keep the conversation going on Twitter, and you can always message me directly. Um, I should also say that anyone, uh, if any of you are in DC at any point in time, please feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to show anyone and everyone around. Um, the Smithsonian is a place for everyone. So, um, so yeah. Okay. Thanks to everybody for attending. Um, we will have uh, access to uh, James's slides on the SlideShare of Serious Games Association. And or James, if you would make them available, I could email them. But the recording itself will be on SlideShare. Questions, yeah. you can also email me, sue at bola.com. And I hope we'll have some of you join us in Pittsburgh. I know. Um, the program is now posted, and we have a, a number of other public um, uh, public or associations and groups that are going to be educational games, um, including the head of the Department of Education STEM Games, who can talk about money that's available to develop educational games. So I hope we'll see you. The conference will be in Pittsburgh, and it, you can look it up on Sirius Play www.seriousplay.conference.com. It's in Pittsburgh, July 20, 21 through 20. Other questions, please call me. Thanks so much, James. It would, uh, I'm sure everybody enjoyed it, including the post discussion. And I hope all of you will uh, let us know if we can provide any other kinds of interesting. Thanks. Let me a question in a minute, OK? Okay, hey, thanks, Sue. Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye bye. Thanks, James. See you soon.